Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gigi Antoni, Director of Learning and Enrichment at the Wallace Foundation. We're so glad that you're here today. We want to thank you for joining our webinar, Using Federal Funds for Summer Learning and After School, a new guide for providers, school districts, and intermediaries. I'm going to start with just a little bit of housekeeping, uh, just to make sure everything goes smoothly uh, today. If you have any technical issues at all, please email events at thehatchergroup.com. Um, please post your questions at any time during the webinar using the Q&A function. The chat function is disabled just for the webinar. Um, this session is being recorded and the recording and slides will be available by Friday on the wallacefoundation.org website, but you can download the guide right now at wallacefoundation.org, uh, the guide that we're going to be discussing um, in the webinar today. And if you're on Twitter, please join the conversation online by using hashtag OST, hashtag summer learning, or hashtag after school. Our goal in the next hour is to leave you with useful ideas for how to fund improved access to high quality after school and summer programs. I'll start with a brief overview and then I'll turn it over to Sheetal Shaw, Senior Advisor for Strategic Partnerships at the US Department of Education, who will share the federal perspective. Then we'll have a terrific panel with Dr. Michael Hinojosa, the former superintendent, Dallas Independent School District, Barbara Kuto Seib, President and CEO Next Up RVA in Richmond, Virginia, and Nathan Beck, Coordinator for Madison Out of School Time in Madison, Wisconsin. We'll take some questions and then we'll hear from Sean Woolery, Policy Advisor for Education Council, who will introduce the new guide. And we'll close by bringing the panelists back on and um, with a few more questions from you. We're here today because out of school time opportunities or OST can confer a wide range of benefits for young people. And that includes academic improvements in reading and math, life skills like pers pers uh, persistence and teamwork. And for older students, improved career readiness, health benefits from exercise and even basic safety. A growing body of research has found dozens of effective approaches with benefits matching program design. For example, a reading program can help in English language skills, rock climbing can build strength and confidence, and you can do both to achieve both benefits. In other words, there are many choices and ways to think about quality after school and out in summer. A 2012 review by Research for Action found more than 60 after school programs that met requirements for the top three evidence tiers of the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA. Researchers noted that effective after-school programs can be found at each grade level and within almost every program type. A similar 2019 review of summer learning programs by RAND found more than 43 programs met ESSA's top tier evidence tiers top three evidence tiers. The authors found that summer programs can be an effective mechanism to address the needs of children and youth. So it's clear that OST matters, but we face two key challenges. The first is that benefits depend on quality. As one expert, Jennifer Sloan McCombs put it, OST programs are beneficial, but not magic. Their effectiveness is driven by the content of the program and the experiences. And that means we need to ensure programs are high quality. The second challenge is inequitable access. A 2020 survey by the After School Allowance Alliance found that for every child that's in a program, an estimate three would attend one if there was a program nearby that, could, that they could afford. And that's an estimated 25 million children. Unmet demand is especially large for those from low-income families or families of color. Demand is growing and remains strong in the pandemic and when many were feeling isolated and under strain. So if quality and access matter, what can we do and how can we pay for it? There are no silver bullets, but the guide suggests relying on three kinds of actions. The first, is preparing for program delivery by investing in physical infrastructure, 
qualified staff and in careful planning. The second is building an ecosystem of support, partnerships between schools and community organizations. And since none of us get things right the very first time, continuous improvement is key to quality. But of all of these, uh, both of these are foundations for what's most important, creating equitable conditions for learning with rigorous engaging opportunities, caring relationships, and safe supportive environments that give kids what they need, when they need it, and the way they need it. As this graphic shows, these elements reinforce each other, and the guide shows which federal funds can support each. Because federal funds are so important, I'm delighted to introduce Sheethal Shaw, Senior Advisor on Strategic Partnerships for the U.S. Department of Education. Sheetha was previously Director of Philanthropic Engagement at the American Federation of Teachers and served on the 2020 Biden-Harris Transition Team. Before that, she spent a decade with the National Coalition for Community Schools, where she provided strategic support for policy, advocacy, and implementation. She's also a valued and wonderful colleague. It's uh, great to have you here, Sheetha. And I'm going to turn it over to you for your uh, perspective. Thank you so much, Gigi. And thank you both to Wallace Foundation Ed, and, and Ed Council for inviting me here to share a few remarks. Um, we're grateful, Wallace Foundation, for your leadership in the out of school time space and are super excited um, that you've pulled together this amazing guide that's going to be so useful to practitioners, districts, and intermediaries on how to use these federal funds. That's what we've been trying to push out. Since last summer, um, we know the funding is out there. We want to make sure that districts and communities are utilizing it in a way that is most impactful for all students and families who want access to out of school time, making sure that these students have the access and in, um, access to these opportunities and enrichment activities is a key priority for the secretary. For this reason, it's important that the field really utilize this tranche of one-time relief funds to start and deepen existing efforts. And your guide is gonna be super instrumental in helping this happen. We know, as you stated, Gigi, Clearly, now more than ever, our students need access more than ever to enriching and engaging opportunities to learn, grow, and build community outside of the classroom. We know that out-of-school time programs do have a lasting and positive impacts on our children, and they help to address the effects of the unfinished instruction and gaps in social-emotional learning that have occurred throughout the pandemic and are still occurring as we're beginning to recover. We know that these COVID relief funds can continue to significantly increase out of school time, but states, cities, and districts, we also know have been struggling. It's either that they don't know that it's an option for them to use their funds that are not in the state set asides to increase this access, and or they just may not understand the value of investing in out of school time related to other spending priorities that they're trying to balance. So again, I mean, I do not mean to keep repeating it, Gigi, but this guide I think is gonna really be super helpful to the advocates and community-based organizations and district staff that really do want to make this happen for all of our students. And so, the department wants to scream from the rooftops that yes, we can use these federal relief funds. And as you may know, we did scream from our rooftop here at the department last week when the secretary announced our new Engage Every Student initiative. We're implementing this initiative in partnership with AASA, After School Alliance, National League of Cities, the National Comprehensive Center, and the National Summer Learning Association. We know that it will take all of us to make this happen and support all students. The hope is that this national partnership will serve as a model for local communities. Something that's extremely important to the secretary is that we do what we want others to do. And if we're not partnering at the national level to for this concerted effort, how can we expect to call upon our local and state partners to do the same? So I'm extremely thrilled to have such a wide array of stakeholders on this call from state officials, local officials, practitioners, um, from school districts. It's This is what we need. And I hope that you will take this guide and 
learn from these best examples that you're going to hear about after I'm done um, and share because we need more of it. As a follow up to the ARP Summit and last year's Summer Learning Enrichment Collaborative, which I think many of you are familiar with, this Engage Every Student initiative builds upon that. It's a call to action for state cities and communities to use these ARP resources in providing access to summer learning and enrichment for every child and family that wants a spot. We're especially excited that so many cities and intermediary organizations and community-based programs have already signed on as allies. We know that there's no lack of state and local partners. Each state also has 21st Century Community Learning Center state coordinator. Each state also has a statewide after school network. So communities across the country already have these high quality programs. How do we expand and deepen them? And ensure that when this federal funding runs out, that it continues. Um, and so quickly, I just wanna share with you some of the goals of the initiative. Um, first and foremost, it's to encourage cities, schools, and districts local government agencies, community-based organizations, and anyone else connected to out-of-school time, efforts to take up this call to action on universal access and to encourage the utilization of these federal funds. Um, it, since we know that out-of-school time is an evidence-based strategy to support every student from recovery, or every student um, to recover from lost instructional time. And so through this initiative, we hope to use our leadership at the department and Bully Pulpit to ensure that all of the stakeholders I just mentioned know that out of school time is a research-based and evidence-based strategy to support social, emotional, and academic growth. We will also have a new and already launched, um, created, co-created and co-branded website where organizations, programs, city officials, districts can make commitments to take action to help us get to ensuring every child has a spot in high quality out of school time, as well as um, get resources such as this guide. Gigi, I hope we can put this guide up on the website as well on engageeverystudent.org so that practitioners and districts have a place to go to build their capacity and to receive technical assistance, which is the third thing, is that through this national partnership, we will be providing coordinated support um, by organizing the technical assistance offerings in one centralized location on this website. Um, so lastly, I will wrap up because I know I'm over time, is that the outcomes, both short and long-term that we hope to achieve through this partnership is that we're increasing opportunities for students. We're decreasing opportunity gaps for students in low-income communities, that there is an increased state and local allocation of resources to out-of-school time. We're increasing local partnerships connected to out-of-school time. And we're measuring um, how we're incorporating youth voice into programming and policy. And you know, for those of you who tuned in um, to the event last week, you may have heard our colleague Eric from Minnesota Department of Education say, you know, it's great to have youth voice at the table to help plan for the future, but I need their help now. So how are we engaging them in the moment beyond their voice, but bringing them into projects, helping them de design and develop um, out of school time programming that they know they actually want and other young people will want more of. So, and then lastly, the long-term goal being that every student has access to the high quality out of school time that they deserve. Um, so thank you again, um, Gigi Wallace Foundation and Ed Council for inviting the Department of Ed to participate in this webinar. Thank you, Sheetal, so much for coming and spending your time with us. We're very, very glad to hear from you and really want to thank you for all of the support that U.S. Department of Education has been giving the field uh, throughout the, the last several years in out-of-school time. We really uh, appreciate you and your partnership. So... Next, I really am excited to introduce to you um, our three distinguished panelists for a conversation. Each will share insights from very unique vantage points as they think about um, how this work looks on the ground. I want to start by introducing Dr. Michael Hinojosa. 
He's the former superintendent of the Dallas Independent School District. He served there for 13 years in two separate stints. He's developed strong, effective community partners to address student needs and is known as a national leader in integrating summer learning and after school with the help of Big Thought, an intermediary organization in Dallas that connects out of school time providers with the school system that serves 150,000 students. Welcome, Dr. Hinojosa, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Gigi, and thank all of you for joining us on this hot afternoon all over the country. At least you're in the air conditioning, and maybe we'll learn something together as we go down this journey. I want to talk about what Dallas ISD, and I, I just left, July 4th was Independence Day, and July 5th was my Independence Day. So I was involved in the planning of what I'm about to describe um, that uh, we took on when we had the opportunity to use additional federal funds. When we looked at the ex learning acceleration, we wanted to make sure that this was exciting for the students, for the families, and for our community partners. So this was not hard for us to launch. That's only because of the great partnerships we've had since 2005 or 2006 with Big Thought, with the city of Dallas, and, and uh, the Dallas Independent School District, and other many other providers um, that are in this space. We think that it was just part of our DNA. So as we put a team together to go put this plan together, um, one of my uh, deputy chiefs, Dr. Derek Little, went everywhere and we had to talk to a lot of people to put this plan together. And let me talk about some very specific things regarding out of school time. What we decided to do was that uh, at our high priority campuses, the schools that were struggling the most, we identified 60 campuses that really struggled the most. What we wanted them to experience were the arts and out of school learning from three to 6 p.m. We wanted the kids to say, mom, don't pick me up at three, let me stay till six. They're gonna give me a third meal and we're also gonna have fun. And we decided that we would trick them into learning. Once you've got them engaged and having fun, then you hit them with the curriculum and they don't even know what hit them. And all of a sudden the acceleration happens. Then we also had another strategy of going to year round calendars. We had a high threshold, 80% of the staff and 80% of, uh, of the parents had to agree. And we had out of 236 campuses, we had 46 of them that decided to go to uh, a non-traditional calendar. And out of school time was a critical part of this, in this, uh, this calendar. We had five schools that got to completely reinvent their, they taught the same curriculum, but now they had the whole year to do it. So they could bring in a starving artist in the middle of the day because now they had the whole year to cover the curriculum. So this is kind of in school, out of school, the, the time, the pressure of time was no longer on those teachers. We had 41 campuses that did intercession calendar where they went to school five weeks, they were off a week. And then that week that they were off, the students that needed the most help, we targeted them and brought them in, made it fun and, and, and made sure that opportunities, but we also made sure that it was enriching and that they had the joy of learning come back to what they were trying to get done. And then we also decided to reinvent summer school. Um, Summer school this time had to be, we called it Summer Breeze, and we call it the Isley Brothers version of Summer Breeze, where we wanted it to be cool to be in school in the summer. And so we couldn't do this by ourselves. And so we did the month of June, and a partner, Big Thought, did the month of July, or vice versa. I can't even remember. I'm so old, I can't remember all these things. But we divvied up the work because there's no way our teachers were tired and we didn't have the capacity you know, the energy. So you had to have natural partners uh, who would help you pull this off. Now, a lot of people were concerned about the learning loss, but let me tell you this, and I think, you know, I know that this is not a, a, a controlled study, so, but it, it is relational. Um, many of our students are already back to pre-pandemic uh, learning. We had significant double digit gains in these schools, and especially with our African-American students that were the furthest behind. We had double digit gains in reading, we had significant gains in math, and I attribute this to making sure that we had fun in school and out of school so that they, what they were learning um, in the non-traditional space 
was impacting their academic performance. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it and I'll turn it back to Gigi. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Hinojosa. And next I, I want to bring uh, Barbara Kuta Sipes um, on. Uh, Barbara is president and CEO of Next Up RVA in Richmond, Virginia. Next Up is also an intermediary that links providers and schools like the organization it's modeled uh, on based in Providence, Rhode Island. Next Up focuses on ensuring that all Richmond middle school students have access to high quality learning experiences beyond the classroom. And uh, Barbara has led the organization for nine years. Welcome, Barbara. Really glad that you could join us today. Hi, Gigi. We're um, really happy to be here and be included in the conversation. And um, I'll give a little bit of a background on us uh, in, in a few minutes. Okay, great. And Nathan uh, Beck is our uh, next panelist. He's been coordinator for Madison Out of School Time in Madison, Wisconsin for the past five years. Now, Nathan is in the unusual position of working half time for the Madison City Government and half time for the Madison Metropolitan School District. From his very unique dual perch, he works often behind the scenes as an internal advocate um, for OST. Um, Barbara, glad let's to be go. Here. I'm so glad you're here, Nathan. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so Dr. Hinojosa gave us some wonderful background about um, how Dallas thought about the extending time and using learning and community partners to, to do that work. Um, let me turn it over to you for a minute. And why don't you um, tell us a little bit about this function that Next Up has of sort of brokering uh, how this brokering process works and give us an example of how you keep quality uh, front and center in your partnership. And uh, thanks again for having me here to share a little bit of what's happening in Richmond, Virginia with everyone. Uh, Next Up RVA, we are a nonprofit organization and we are what you call an expanded learning system intermediary. We're a, a part of a wonderful national coalition of uh, similar system cities called Every Hour Counts, which has been a wonderful resource for us as we um, have grown. We were just created in 2013, so we're not really that old. We're pretty young as an organization, and we were created out of a bold question that the Richmond Public Schools leadership and the business community and philanthropic partners had asked one another, and that was what would it take to put more Richmond Public School teams on a path to success. And they, this group formed a working group and they looked across the country and they looked at the work that the Wallace Foundation had been doing around out of school time systems development. And they looked at every hour counts and they came back with the answer that what we needed to do in Richmond was to bring better coordination and funding and accountability to enrichment programs and bring those enrichment programs into our middle schools. Richmond, like, like many communities, is very service rich, but pretty coordination poor. We had a lot of um, fragmented programs, people kind of crawling over each other, principals answering a million calls every week from people that really wanted to come in and help. And so what the organization that I lead, what we do with Richmond Public Schools is we're responsible for procuring out of school time programs, particularly content enrichment. You think about like STEM classes and arts and humanities, sports and wellness programs and career and workforce leadership programs. And then we provide the funding to those organizations. We have a whole application and vetting process. We schedule those organizations and those programs to come into the middle schools and to deliver those programs either right there on site at the middle school after the last bell has rung or even in the community nearby and the kids start and finish their evenings at the middle school. And what that really does is create a wonderful accountability and incentive to return back to school every day, driving school day attendance. Um, quality is a huge thing that we look at as part of this work and with that quality, we partner with United Way and Virginia Commonwealth University to provide professional development and quality controls and quality assurances um, for our provider community. And then we track that data every week to look at the participation levels 
um, across all of the providers that we are working with. Um, so it's been a really great partnership. We have uh, worked with over 2,000 kids across our system and more than 70 community partners now. Um, and we're in five of Richmond Public Schools, um, seven, they have total seven, we are in five. And they're starting to do more and more work um, with our city government as well, particularly with the ARPA funding and coordinating and funding programs in community settings um, throughout the summer and weekends and evenings as well. Great, thank you so much, uh, Barbara. Nathan, um, um, let's let's hear from you now. Can you describe particularly your dual role? I mean, what's interesting I think about the panel is that there's so many different models about how communities can come together to help uh, quality and coordination and scaling. Um, I know you have an example from this summer of what it's allowed uh, your city to do. Um, and so let me turn it over to you for a few minutes. Yeah, thank you so much. And for first, for folks who are curious to learn more, as I imagine everyone on here is, I'm really appreciate that Barbara um, uplifted every hour counts as a network of out of school time intermediaries with different models, the tools and support and networks that they've given most um, allow us to be here. Also, um, the tons of incredible work that Wallace Foundation has already put out. Um, this is not new. Wallace Foundation has been publishing resources and roadmaps that we have certainly used. Um, so, so please do take a look at that. And now I think a bit about how the role in Madison, Wisconsin actually works and its origin, because it is unique. Um, and most is this really curious intermediary in that I think we have a ton of origin stories, right? Um, I remember when I first started, probably for the first two years, about every week, someone new I met would come up to me and say, hey, did you know that I started most? Um, and I would always say, oh, please, please tell me more. Um, but really, what a gift. Um, this is that so many people see themselves so inter intricately connected. Um, the flip side of that gift is all the people that I'm accountable to, right? Um, but it's mostly just a gift. And that is really the structure and the origin that a lot of people nurture this idea that working in partnership, we are better. And it's really based on this idea that you've got to have three strong pillars, city, schools, and community-based organizations working together. We each have different assets, gifts, and abilities, um, and young people and families deserve that we're doing everything we can. Um, and I think the key value we have that undergirds our success is that we really try to put them all on equal footing, the city, schools, um, and out of school time. Um, so that's the value that uh, at the core of the way we work. This model also is a really strategic, smart way to embed and amplify partnerships to benefit out of school time. And it embeds an ally, organizer, and advocate for the field in large public institutions. I can't tell you how beneficial it is to be embedded within those institutions. I've worked in partnerships before, and it is different um, to be within organizations, to know the rhythms, the ways of work, where and how decisions are made, the stresses that organizations are going under, um, and how who's really the people that get the work done, right, versus the, the figureheads, right? Um, and, and also to be able to shape um, the agenda and the data that city and school leaders see. Um, there have been occasions when I'm coordinating a meeting between the mayor and superintendent, and I'm providing talking points for both of them, right? Um, so a, a real opportunity to shape um, how they actually think about um, things and invest their dollars. But I think the best way to really share this model is to talk about how it enables some really high-level collaboration that benefits young people. So this summer, we had about 600 students um, disenrolled from our district summer, pro um, summer school at the last minute. Now, that is a significant harm for those families, right? Decisions we as a district made caused harm. Their kids were lined up to be engaged in learning um, all summer for free. Um, and then at the last minute, our district was like, whoops, sorry. And here is where without most, that could have been that. An email that goes out to family causes harm. We blame the national teacher shortage um, and move on because there's no solution to that, right? But because we have the infrastructure of relationships in our model, what we've been able to do is offer any of those 600 kids spots in a network of dozens of enriching summer learning programs hosted by community-based organizations. Every kid that enrolls, the district will pay for, even if they enroll in a free program, because we know um, free programs aren't free to offer, right? Um, we're using surplus staff dollars at the district um, to fund this, a precedent that, damn, I am excited about, I'm hoping to continue, right? Um, but here's also the deal. Um, our district will fund it, uh, but our district is not good at writing checks to providers. Um, they're actually really bad at it. They are a school. That's not what they're made for. They're good at other things. Um, and so to keep things simple, or not actually simple, but simpler, um, uh, the district is sending one check over to the city, and the city is distributing it to providers. And we can do this because we've done that before, 
right? Um, it's not the first time. So we're really essentially guaranteeing funds for any provider who enrolls one of those 600 kids. Undergirding this is a network of relationships and trust that was built over years and our shared data infrastructure where we're already sharing personally identifiable data in real time with over 100 different locations. Um, and it's been actually really helpful to think and reflect on this um, because honestly, I've spent most of the summer being really disappointed about this initiative. Um, I honestly, I don't think we're doing enough. And I think in so many areas we could be doing more. And I think that's really because from my vantage point between these three worlds, city, school, and community-based organizations, I, like, I can actually see the possibilities. And I'll be honest, this initiative is not even scratching the surface of what is possible. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly proud of the work we do, um, but there's so much more um, potential for this work if we're able to really and meaningfully do it in partnership. That's great. Thank you so much, all three of you, for your, um, for your remarks. I mean, it's clear that partnerships are uh, really important when we think about expanding access and building quality. Um, and that there are lots of different ways that that can happen. I'm gonna open up for questions from the audience now. And um, we'll start with our first question and it's for Dr. Hinojosa. Um, many see a challenge with the ARP dollars being one-time funding opportunities. How can stakeholders leverage the um, ARP dollars in addition to existing funding to support longer term programming and improvements? Well, that's a very important question and something that we thought a lot about. We did two things. The first thing that we did is we had the opportunity to charge um, overhead or administrative costs. And so we banked 14% of our money for future expenditure. So when the funding cliff comes, we can play it out another year or two. But the biggest thing that's gonna happen and people are gonna to have to be courageous in making this happen, is you're gonna to have to go through a process called strategic abandonment. If this stuff is so good and it impacts kids this much and it makes a difference, then what else are you gonna stop funding? Because your parents are gonna demand it, your board's gonna demand it, your community gonna demand it, and your students deserve it. But I know that a lot of, that a lot, most of our dollars are connected to people. And so, but we all have natural attrition. So it's going to take smart people laying out a plan that's strategic about you fund what gives you the biggest bang. Those are called strategic initiatives. And it's going to be difficult, but it's going to be the right thing to do. And courageous leaders will do it. The ones who don't want to face the music won't do it. And that's a shame. Great. Thank you so much. Here's another question. This one is for you, Barbara. Um, can you give us an example of how intermediaries work, intermediaries work to ensure quality? Can you talk a little bit about quality? Sure. Um, so, so intermediaries, there are several across the country that focus specifically on professional development and continuous quality improvement. Um, they may be the holder of um, a continuous quality improvement process. Uh, one of the, the great leaders of this work is Weikert Institute with the Youth Program Quality Initiative or intervention, I think is the, y, is the I in YPQI. Um, and we have used the YPQI um, uh, program for our program providers that are in our network. And as next up as an intermediary, what we have done is sponsored providers um, to participate in the YPQI uh, program that was that has been managed by our local United Way and um, Virginia Commonwealth University. Some of the other things that we do as an intermediary, um, our, our data management work is a huge part of the service that we provide to the school system and to the out-of-school time providers. And so when we are funding programs and scheduling them, putting them into our menu, we are able to centralize through our data management system, how kids register for the whole menu of program options that they have, and then we can track student participation. So one of the things that my team looks at when school is in session, um, what, one of the things that we're looking at on a weekly basis is what is the participation level in the programs um, that are happening that we are funding. So let's say 20 kids have registered for the garden program um, and we are three weeks in and 20 kids are showing up regularly. We know that's a, that's a really great sign. Let's say there's another program for basket weaving and 15 kids had signed up for that one. But, you know, two weeks in and we're seeing that there's only seven kids 
showing up regularly. And the third week, there's five. Quality issue is at this age, kids vote with their feet. So we immediately have a team that jumps in there to go observe that program, offer some feedback, um, and then wrap supports around them. If that is, a, you know, if it's an improvement, I, something that can be improved. Um, but I'll be honest, sometimes we have programs that we also have to let go, mm -hmm. um, that they're not able to deliver quality. And Gigi, as you said, quality is what makes the impact. Absolutely. And so our promise to Richmond Public School students and to the families is that we are going to organize and deliver high quality programs to you because you deserve it. And that's what makes the difference. Great. Thank you so much, Barbara. It's a really concrete example of uh, multiple things, professional development, um, continuous improvement, and then straight up intervention and really monitoring um, when that needs to happen. Nathan, um, will you handle this one um, for us? And it often feels, this is the question, it often feels as though programs compete with each other. Is this something that panel, that, that you have, um, that you've encountered in your work? And how do you move past this when you're working with a bunch of providers and, and then your public partners? How do you deal with that sort of sense of cannibalization or competition? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest, I, I don't think in our context, we feel that, um, it, 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 I think it's there, but it's not super prescient. I think because we have for years been meeting um, in collaboration, nurturing relationships, really focused on the scale of the problem. The scale of the problem you heard earlier is 25 million young people do not have access, right? Um, and I think in that context, we foreground that and we look for solutions for that. Um, it's, it's not as much about competing, right? There is enough demand, there is enough unmet need um, that uh, we all have our role to play. And so I think the more you can focus on that, I think a lot of the times the conversation um, ignores the scale of the problem. It kind of just assumes that the kids that are attending now are the kids that are attending. It doesn't always look at um, the, the three kids for everyone that are unmet. It also, I think one more point um, and then I'll stop, but you know, we look at it even when we're thinking about funding, we talk about who are the major funders. We always ignore that the biggest funder for after school is parents who can afford to pay for it, right? I mean, so really 70% of the funding in Madison is parents who can afford to pay for it. And so that's really, um, the scale of what's happening um, is pretty significant, and we really need to invest as much um, support into, into solving that as, as possible. And I think that helps um, us focus our, our efforts together collaboratively. Dr. Hina, has it looked like you might want to jump in there? Where, did you have a, something to add? Not really. I just wanted to make the point that, you know, if we have a lot of people in this space, it's beneficial to students. And so we need to figure out who's going to be the traffic cop. Uh, and, and that the ones, the, the survival of the fittest, so the, the best ones that are providing the most support to students and families are the ones that should prevail. And someone needs to kind of referee and organize and go on merit about which ones uh, are, have the best chance for success. Do you have a sense of who, who might in a community be the right folks to take that role of, of looking at quality and making some of those judgments? It's got to be, you got to have very meaningful and genuine relationships between all three, whether it's the city, whether it's the school district, whether it is the provider, uh, and there has to be some kind of synergy of people working together. And that's one of the reasons we've survived is that we've had such a deep relationship with, you know, all, all three of us in that field, not necessarily at the senior level, but at the ground level, our teams work very well together. And they need to just be able to make those calls when there is a lot of traffic. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna, um, we're gonna bring the panel back at the end. We have a lot of questions for you. So there's a lot of interest in asking questions, but I'm gonna uh, shift now for a minute and we're gonna bring Sean, um, Sean on to take a look at the guide um, and help us understand a little bit about how it can help us think about um, this idea that it isn't just about, it is about building quality and it is about act access for the long-term, um, but it's also about delivering high quality programs by building an infrastructure to support them and thinking about the entire um, sort of uh, amount of work and the kinds of work that need to happen to deliver 
what kids deserve. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul, uh, to Sean, and we'll hear a little bit more about it. Sorry about that, Sean. <laughs> that's all right. Gigi, I think that's a new one for me. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for the introduction. And, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we are certainly excited um, to get this publication out to the field. And we uh, sincerely hope that this will be useful to leaders. I think from what we've heard so far um, from our panelists and from uh, Sheetal at the Department of Education that clearly OST programs play an important role in the uh, lives of youth, in their development, in their success. And what we hope that this guide, um, as Gigi alluded, can provide an additional tool for all stakeholders to see what are the funding opportunities to support the critical work that's happening in both program implementation, but program design and program improvement. Um, all three of those are really important um, so that we constantly deliver quality uh, uh, results for uh, youth and, and the communities that we serve. Um, this publication is, is really uh, something that we, we hope will illustrate that there are a lot of opportunities within the uh, pandemic relief funding that Sheetal was describing from the American Rescue Plan or from the uh, previous COVID relief packages that were dispersed. That of course, that there's a lot of one-time uh, uh, funding within those packages that have gone out to the field. And those offer a lot of opportunity to uh, uh, either create some new programs, to expand existing programs or to improve uh, some programs. But that funding we know will run out. We know it has an expiration date on it. And so what we set out to do was try to identify then well, what are the other existing federal funds that can be used to continue uh, those necessary investments and those critical investments to support our youth once that funding runs out. And we hope that this guide will illustrate that. Um, before I dig into our process and the journey that we took to develop this guide, really just wanted to take a moment to say thank you uh, to all of the folks that were involved in um, the, the brainstorming of this publication, the review of this publication, that this is really a, a result of a, a true community effort. Um, similarly to know how we know that quality OST programs are, is that there needs to be a strong ecosystem of stakeholders involved and in really to, to create a, a quality product uh, uh, um, at the end. And, and what, we, what we are thankful for is the folks that went into uh, the creation of this. We had the opportunity to speak with some national leaders um, and hear from their perspective. And we were so thankful to have the opportunity to in engage with some local leaders uh, for some initial reviews of, of the draft of this publication. When we wanted to create this, we, again, we're setting out to identify how the federal funds can support um, OST programs, which we knew that broadly federal funds could be used to support uh, quality OST programs, but we wanted to dig deeper and to be specific. And so we wanted to engage with, like I said, national leaders to hear from them, to, to listen and to learn about what's on their minds when it comes to OST programs and, and what is top of mind as it relates to quality, as well as we know that the field has had the fortune of, of having a significant amount of evidence and, and research to suggest what are those elements that need to be involved in both the uh, building, improving, and sustaining of quality OST programs. And so we looked at the literature too. We didn't want to um, create recreate the wheel here, but we really wanted to lift up and build upon what the field had already known to be true. From there, we did from our listening and from our reviewing, we pulled together those common elements that Gigi referenced before um, that are so critical to OST programs. The um, elements that go into preparing and for planning, the elements that go into uh, building strategic partnerships, and, and the elements that go into um, really thinking about the equitable conditions for learning. Once we were able to pull those elements together, we again wanted to think about then, okay, what are the federal funds that can be used to support each of those elements discreetly as well as comprehensively? And so we ultimately reviewed over 30 federal programs um, and included 24 in the final building, sustaining and improving publication. Um, now, we know that this publication is not a comprehensive review. Um, and just because of federal funding program was not included in this publication doesn't mean that there are not opportunities there. However, we wanted to include the federal funds that we felt and we believed had one, the most central uh, focus or opportunities uh, related to high quality OSC programming, 
programs, uh, federal programs that can be uh, accessed by uh, core stakeholders, such as uh, community-based organizations, nonprofit organizations, city leaders, uh, school district leaders. And two, we wanted to think about programs that could have, from a monetary uh, standpoint, have that significant impact um, on uh, allowing and, and providing those financial resources that we know are so important. After we reviewed those programs, we wanted to connect each of those two the elements and thinking about not only how the funds can be used for the elements, but how can the funds be used for the actions that go into each of these. And so that's ultimately what uh, uh, we created with the publication. To give you a broad sense of the publication itself, it's divided into three parts. Part one is going to make that connection between the federal funds and each of the elements and the actions that go into it. Part two is really gonna be a deep dive into each of the federal funding sources. So we provide here um, an overview of the funding uh, program. We highlight the relevant uses or, or allowable uses underneath federal law or federal regulation for each of those funds as they relate to OSC programs. And we want to connect you directly to the federal website that has and hosts information on each of these federal funds. So that in the case that you're interested in seeing how you can pursue those for your individual context, we wanted to make it easy for you to find additional information, including if it's a competitive grant program or even if it's a, a formula grant program is that we wanted to connect you to that official federal government website. And then lastly, in part three, again, recognizing that the field itself has a wealth of information around implementation, around considering equity um, within programs, and of course, what is the evidence base to suggest what is critical for OSD programs. And so we included part three here as an appendix to lift up some of the resources that were so important in the creation of this publication, but also just we know to be important for the field itself as well. So with that broad overview, I wanted to walk you all through the guide itself as through an example um, to really make this real for you all and to, to provide um, just a, a real quick idea of how you could potentially use this guide uh, back home in your context with your communities. So as Gigi alluded before, we identified the seven elements of high quality OST programs. We recognize here, and we are really intentional with the way that we visualize these to recognize that each of the elements while they are, are illustrated discreetly, they're also illustrated in a way that, that, rec that has a relationship to one another. There's a collective critical nature of these elements together um, to really thinking about how programs, program leaders, how district leaders, how city leaders can think about all of the elements comprehensively to de deliver high quality programming. But we recognize that as a leader within your program, you may not be able to address each of the elements at the same time. That would be a lot. And so there is an important strategic way to look at some of these funds individually, while also not losing sight, uh, I'm sorry, these elements individually, while also not losing sight of their collective uh, relationship to one another. So for instance, if you're thinking about how to um, really create and sustain equitable conditions for learning and thinking specifically about the importance of safe and supportive environments for youth in your program, I wanna walk you through how the publication can uh, help you identify the federal funds for that element there. So just give me, bear with me one second, I'm going to transition screens here. And when you go to the publication, of course, you'll see here, and, and we really are proud about this initial, graph as well, or initial graphic as well, because we recognize and wanted to highlight that summer and after school learning programs happen in a variety of spaces and a variety of contexts. And we hope that this guide can complement uh, that diverse array by showing the diverse array of federal funds. So when you go to the publication, uh, you're going to find that you'll turn to the safe and supportive environment section of the publication. And when you see here that we included additionally some considerations for program design and implementation. And again, this is just a recognition of the wealth of information that exists in the field. So we've pulled this from our conversations with national leaders or review of existing guides or, or resources and, and pulled out some key points here. We also recognize that OST programs can be a very key lever for advancing um, equity for youth um, and attending to their needs and the context um, that they uh, live and, and learn in. And so we wanted to pull out specifically some elements for thinking about how leaders can design with a, a lens toward equity. Now, the next page is gonna be the, the uh, meat of the publication. And it's gonna seem a bit overwhelming at first, but 
um, instead of seeming overwhelmed, I would uh, encourage you to, to flip that and really see it as an opportunity. And it's really gonna illustrate that there are so many options uh, within federal funds that can be used to support each of these actions. So you turn to the next page and you're gonna see that we've created for each of the elements, a matrix that um, summarizes our review of the 24 federal programs that are included in this publication and how each of those may or may not be able to support the elements such as safe and supportive environments, but more specifically, how the funds can be used to support the discrete actions within that element. So for instance, if you're thinking about um, the importance of and the, the actions necessary to create positive, inclusive site climates and employing culturally responsive approaches, that first row in the publication, there are a variety of federal funds that can be used to support that action alone. Um, and that's what we look at for each of the federal funds. And this is repeated, this format and this analysis is repeated for each of the other seven elements uh, within this guide and what we know to be true about high quality OST programs. That's really section two. Section three is going to then dive into, I'm sorry, that's section one. Section two is going to dive into the federal funds themselves. And so for instance, if you look at this guide and you see that Title IV Part F or the Promise Neighborhoods Program has an opportunity to support some of this work. If you're viewing this electronically, you can actually click on this title here and be brought immediately to section three that describes and provides additional information for this federal program. So you'll see for each federal program, we provide a brief summary of the program. Again, we pull out those relevant allowable uses for um, the funds as they relate to OST programs. We provide some information around the type of funding. So is this gonna be a competitive formula? Um, I'm sorry, is this gonna be a competitive grant or is it going to be a formula program? We recognize that that may um, have considerations for if you want to access or are able to access those funds. We also wanted to highlight who are the funding recipients for these funds um, for a couple of reasons. One, we wanted to be able to um, share with you that if you are one of the recipients, that this is um, a program that has a, a big opportunity for you to uh, uh, think about and involve in your programming. But if you're not a primary recipient, we recognize that and what we hope is a takeaway from this conversation is that there is an ecosystem of stakeholders. And so thinking then, how can you work with your partners to access some of these other funds that can be used for, to support through a blending and braiding approach, the OSC programs in your community. Um, and there are a variety of stakeholders that can access each of the funds. And then lastly, highlighting again that for each of the federal funds, we provide some direct links to the federal uh, website that has additional information um, on, on the uh, individual um, programs. Again, we really hope that this guide um, does a couple of things. One, it demonstrates the diverse array of federal funds that can be used to support OSC programs. We hope that it can provide you a clear roadmap for how those funds can be used to support the individual actions for your, uh, uh, your OSC programs. And thirdly, we hope that this can start a conversation within your communities. We recognize that each community has its own unique context and circumstances. Um, it has its own unique community that it serves. And so we want this to be a conversation with all stakeholders to see how can we strategically come together in genuine partnership to use our existing and allowable resources to support our OST programs, ultimately leading to more positive, impactful uh, impacts on our youth and, and their families. So with that, again, we really hope that this is a resource that can be uh, useful for you all and the field uh, uh, at large. Thank you. Sean, um, Ed first and Sean Woolery, I just have to take a moment and say thank you so much for the wonderful work on this guide and uh, for coordinating all of the community conversations for your expertise um, and for this great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so we are getting towards the end of our time and I'm gonna um, ask if there are any questions for Sean or um, or the panel. I'm going to ask the panel to please come back on and join us. Um, there's so many great questions here. I think um, I'm going to uh, ask, uh, I'm going to take just a minute. Here we go. Um, so one of the uh, questions that are here, are any of the federal funds that are um, in the guide, Sean, are they 
um, only for large school districts, for networks, for nonprofit organizations. Can you talk a little bit about the breadth of if you're a large school district or, or a small one? Um, is there something in the guide for everyone? Um, Yes, we, we hope that there is something here for everyone um, and for um, to, to illustrate that federal funds are actually widely accessible to a variety of stakeholders, that it's not just your large school districts, it's not just your states that can access this funding. Oftentimes that there's built into some of these programs that um, it's more competitive actually to have a consortium of variety stakeholders to access this funding directly. So it's a, a partnership um, across all of the stakeholders, um, as well as I will note that there are some programs that are only accessible to certain stakeholders. So for instance, Title I Part A of the Elementary and Secondary School Act, that's going to directly go from your state agency to your, uh, your local district. However, your local districts can use those funds to engage in partnerships with your OST providers, your community-based organizations. So even if a fund is not directly accessible to you in the place that you sit, that doesn't mean the funds can't be used in a collaborative blended way. Great, thank you so much. So we are very, very close to the end of our time and we have a lot of really great questions that have been generated by the audience. So um, we're gonna collect those questions, we're gonna collect answers to those questions and we're gonna publish them for you in an FAQ so that we can get to all of your questions and still uh, keep our time. So um, I'm just gonna, I think, ask um, our panelists, um, each to uh, maybe starting with Barbara, I'm gonna to like to close by asking each of you in just a minute, um, what advice would you give on federal after school and, and on funding after school and summer from your specific perches? And we have just about a minute each and then we'll need to say goodbye to our wonderful audience. Why don't we start with you, Barbara? Okay, I think for the school perspective, I think it's important for schools to um, dedicate someone within the administration responsible for partnerships and to bring in their federal grants writers to be a part of that conversation um, and to look outward, bring in partners on those grants. It's very important. I think for the out of school time provider community, um, especially for the small providers and even and those that it might be community entrepreneurs or for-profit programs, jump in with the larger nonprofit organizations in your community. If you don't have an intermediary like Next Up, look to your YMCA, your Boys and Girls Clubs. Um, they are often uh, writing large grants and pulling in content providers for their services too. Great, thank you so much. Nathan? Yeah, I think my advice is primarily for city and school staff, um, and it is be humble and be responsible. Um, approach your community-based organizations as equal partners who probably have more insight into young people in your community than you do, right? And I think that humbleness is important. And be responsible. You work for public institutions with significant infrastructure, stability, and funds. Community-based organizations do not. Um, I don't care what, what level you're at. Like, you probably don't pull the purse strings. I don't. Um, come today every day understanding it is your responsibility, it is my responsibility that every young person has access to meaningful quality after school, right? Um, we're working for public institutions. It's our job. Thanks, Nathan. Sean? Yeah, I think the one thing that I would say as a piece of advice is to really just think creatively and not only thinking about how can you use one federal funding stream that's in this guide to support OSC programs that may be new, but what we what we hope the guide also illustrates is that federal funding streams, if maybe you're using one stream already for OST programs, maybe there's a different stream that you could be using for that same work, and that opens up opportunities for the other streams to be used um, a, another way. So not only thinking about this as new funding streams, but how you can use existing streams that you have differently. Great, thank you. And we'll give you the last word, Dr. Hinojosa. What's your advice? Well, my advice is that incrementalism is innovation's worst enemy. So you got to figure out how to do something big. Nothing great happens in the absence of enthusiasm. So you got to find a way to take win-win opportunities because our students deserve it and they need it. And so especially in this very critical time. So uh, thank you very much for allowing me to participate. 
We are so very, very grateful to all of you and to Sheetal uh, for taking your time today. I also want to thank all of the hundreds of you who spent the last hour with us um, in closing the awful impact of the pandemic has elevated attention on after school and summer. It's also provided an influx of federal funds. We have a moment of opportunity now to help kids regain lost ground, but also to build for the future. Um, we hope this webinar and the guide will provide you with a few ideas about how to do that. Um, as a reminder, recording of the webinar and the slides will be posted on wallacefoundation.org on Friday, and you can download the guide at wallacefoundation.org along with other evidence and lessons on putting on high quality after school and summer programs. Thank you all very much for your time and have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>